Hey, what's up, guys? So as many of you know, this whole coronavirus lockdown has many of us quarantined inside. My girlfriend came to stay with me temporarily, and as you can see, she commandeered my workspace. And what I'm left with is this shaky and unstable filing cabinet as my workspace. I want to design something that's foldable so when this whole lockdown is over, I can fold it away and it won't take too much space. Another reason is that I wanted to stretch out my legs and of course the filing cabinet won't let me. So this is what I came up with. The first step was to take some measurements of my personal desk and after that I designed something. Now let me show you what I designed. Alright, this is a solution that I came up with. On the left side you can see a 1 to 1 scale model of the desk that you saw earlier. And on the right side you can see the desk extension itself. So the way this works is that uh, if you look at this uh, leg assembly over here, it's held in place by these two thumb screws that you see here and over here, which then go through a nut attached to the half inch square tubing. There's a hole dr uh, drilled in the uh, square tubing, which allows the thumb screw to go through and tension it against the uh, round stock uh, bottom leg assembly over here. Uh, when you do want to retract it, all you simply do is you loosen the two thumb screws, you pull up on the uh, uh, bottom leg assembly over here, then you can fold the whole leg assembly into the desk extension, To which, at which point you can fold down the whole desk extension on these hinges, and it will stay up against the uh, side of the desk over here. I'm not really going to talk about the materials as it will be explained later on in the video, uh, but everything I used was quite inexpensive and you can find it at any big box hardware store. If you guys are interested in the direct links to the uh, products that I used, uh, just leave a comment in the comment section below. And I will be posting the uh, files to this whole assembly, that way you guys can view it and get actual measurements or you know, if you want um, to modify it, you can do it really whatever you want. This is uh, you know, open source. So now that I uh, talked about how this works, I wanna show it in motion. Like I said, this is its uh, fully extended state. Uh, if you want to uh, retract it, first you loosen the two thumb screws, right? And then you can pull up on the bottom leg assembly, fold it into the uh, actual extension itself. Then you can fold down the desk extension. As you can see, it becomes nice and compact, uh, quite uh, you know space saving, and it's quite convenient to use. All right, now that we talked about the 3D design, let's go to the actual fabrication. The first task is for us to cut out the extension top from a uh, sheet of two foot by two foot plywood. The first cut that you see is just a facing cut, so I have an even uh, reference edge to go off of. Uh, by the way, all my units are in millimeters. Uh, for those of you who are concerned, it's just a little bit more accurate. If you don't have a table saw, don't worry. You can also do this with a circular saw and guide or a jigsaw and guide. Uh, the little mini job site uh, table saws are also very inexpensive. I also took this chance to rip down uh, four 50 millimeter wide uh, strips of plywood for the sides. I cut these from some scrap plywood that I had, but you know, if you do need to buy extra plywood, like I said, you could just buy another spare sheet of uh, two foot by two foot uh, by three quarter inch thick plywood. Next, whether by power tool or by hand, you're gonna to wanna to take some 220 grit sandpaper and sand down the surfaces and edges. I also recommend you wipe the surface with some tack cloth to remove any dust. Now, this is not a strictly necessary step, but whenever I get the chance, I do like to put some edge banding on plywood. It makes the plywood look like a solid piece of wood, and that's always great. While I'm not really going to get into the process, as there are many YouTube videos better than mine explaining how to edge band, basically, you just cut a strip of edge band that's a little bit longer than the edge that you're banding, and then you just uh, put an iron on it uh, that's a set on cotton setting and just iron it on, after which, you can then take a knife to cut off the little bit of excess at the ends, take some sandpaper and a hand file, or rather a hand plane, and just uh, take down the edges until it's flush with the wood. And trust me, it's very, very easy to do. But also, I am a sucker for appearances. Here's the old naked edge compared with the new edge banded edge. As you can see, it's a night and day difference. 
I do want to note that edge bands do have thickness. In my case, it added two millimeters to the length and width measurements. So make sure to account for that. Now we can cut the 600 millimeter or in my case, 602 millimeter long sides to account for the edge banding. The first and third cuts are just facing cuts just to clean up the ends before I cut them to length. Next, mark out and drill the quarter inch holes that go into the sides, but pay attention to the orientation. If you look at the 3D model, you'll see that the holes are mirrored from each other in regards to the front and rear sides. Make sure to put a mark on the side that faces outwards so you don't lose track of orientation. The countersink should only go deep enough so that the top of the machine screw will be flush to the surface of the wood, as you can see here. This will serve as the pivot for the leg assembly. Now you can see me setting up the front and rear sides for attachment to the top. I'm using a Craig pocket hole jig because it saves me a lot of time and I do frequently do a lot of stuff like this. You can really use any method you find appropriate. Hell, you could even use nails from the bottom or the top. You could use just screws, like really long screws coming in from the bottom. Whatever you find appropriate, you don't have to use pocket screws, but I will say they are extremely convenient and there are very low priced, uh, like lesser versions of this jig that is just a hair more inconvenient than this version, but they are still very usable. You could also use glue, but I find that very inaccurate. Next step is to attach the front and rear sides. Like I said before, you can attach it in any manner you see fit, but I use pocket screws. Referring back to the 3D model, it is very important to remember that the holes have a specific orientation. The small diameter, aka the one quarter inch diameter, should be facing inwards uh, and they should be facing each other. The countersink side, so the larger 15 millimeter diameter, should be facing outwards. And like I said, they should both be towards the uh, right side of the extension. So make sure you pay attention to that. You might have noticed that I haven't cut out the left and right side yet. And that's because I want an absolutely perfect fit, which is why I waited until now just to double check the measurement between the front and rear side. Now I happen to be on the dot in terms of fitment. However, I just want to be sure. When it comes to wood, there's always a good chance for variation and warping. Now you can cut out the left and right sides. Make sure to compensate for edge banding if you did choose to do that. We are going to attach this the same way we attached the uh, front and rear side. Uh, the only difference is I added a pocket hole at either end. Make sure to sand down everything with 220 grit sandpaper and also wipe down everything with a good tack cloth. Another optional cosmetic step, you could spray paint this or really color this however you want or leave it bare. I chose to use Danish oil because I already had it in my garage. It was cheap and it's really easy to use. Man, that looks great. While we let it cure for eight to 10 hours, we'll go ahead and work on the metal leg assembly. The first step in the metal leg assembly is to wire brush off all the mill scale and rust off the half inch square tubing and the 3 8 round stock. That is unless you like the rusty look and or light gang tetanus. Next, you're gonna wanna face off one end of each piece of stock this is so we can get accurate measurements in reference to either end. The metal block you see is just clamped perpendicular to the sanding wheel. This is so I can easily get flat ends rather than trying it by hand. After you faced off one of the ends, take one of the half inch square tube and we're gonna start with the 380 millimeter leg. I'm using some Daikin blue and a knife to mark the 380 millimeter mark. You can then cut it down with a angle grinder. Leave a little bit room because we will be sanding or filing it down afterwards to get a really nice square face. Go back to your grinder, sander, or filer and sand the whole thing down to length. Constantly check 
the length just to make sure you don't, uh, you know, sand away too much. We're now gonna use that same process to make another 380 millimeter square tube leg, a 558 millimeter square tube leg support, and two 400 millimeter 3 8 inch round stock legs. This is what you should end up with. Make sure to file off any sharp edges or burrs. Next, we're gonna mark out the quarter inch hole that goes through both sides at the top where the pivot goes through. And also the quarter inch hole that only goes through one side where the thumb screw goes through. The thumb screw hole is on the same face as one of the pivot holes. We're also gonna mark out the two 3 8 holes that go on the 558 millimeter uh, leg support. Drill those aforementioned holes to spec. I recommend you step up in drill size, meaning that you start from a small diameter going all the way up to your nominal diameter. What you see here is me putting down a few tack welds to attach the quarter inch nut to the 380 millimeter thumb screw hole. You don't have to use a welder, you could use JB Weld or epoxy, however welding in my opinion is the best option. Here you can see the round stock leg assembly. On the bottom we have the 558 millimeter square tube support. The bottom of the round stock legs is offset 5 millimeters from the bottom of the square tube support. I put the washers under the round stock legs and the red magnets to keep everything perpendicular with each other. Small detail, but if you're welding, I put my ground mag clamp on the metal table itself. Same procedure as before, but this time I laid some tack welds where the round stock met the square tube. The support isn't exactly a load-bearing area, so I wouldn't be too concerned about making this super heavy-duty. Now you can see how the leg mechanism works. Since this is done, we now want to throw some paint onto here. You can really use whatever paint you want. I just used some bottom of the barrel cheapo black paint I had laying around. So while these dry, we're gonna go ahead and take care of the magnets and I'll explain their purpose in a bit. What you're looking at over here is the corner by the pivot hole. I'm epoxying two 18 millimeter diameter by five millimeter thickness ceramic magnets. The purpose of these magnets by the pivot is to hold the leg steady when it's fully extended. That way it's not swinging wildly around when you've just swung it down. You'll see me put some bolts and washers near the magnet just to prevent it from moving towards the steel screw. Now we're gonna continue and do the same thing for the other side. The magnets I'm epoxying here are to keep the legs in place when you fold them up, that way you're not fighting with them as you fold the whole extension down. They are located 380 millimeters away from the side that has the pivot. While that epoxy cures, we're gonna go ahead and epoxy these little rubber washers on the bottom of the round stock leg assembly. This is just to protect the floor from scratches. All right, last step before assembly. We're gonna go ahead and attach these two hinges over here. It's pretty easy to do so. All you have to do is just mark out where you need to put the hinge, pre-drill the holes, and then put in the screws by hand. I do not recommend using a power tool for that. Finally, we can get to assembly. You'll need two quarter inch by 20 by two inch long countersink machine screws, four quarter inch by 20 nuts, and four 
quarter inch by one inch fender washer, and of course, the leg assembly itself. First, insert the screw into the pivot hole. Follow that with a fender washer and then the square tube leg with the thumb screw facing inwards. Add another fender washer onto the assembly. Finally, thread on two nuts. Tighten the first nut until you feel the square tube leg give you some resistance when you try to swing it up and down. And then you can tighten the second nut against the first nut. Go ahead and repeat that process for the other side. Fold the legs up and loosen the screws until they're no longer in the square tube channel. Then you can insert the lower leg assembly in. I don't recommend using any sort of lubricating fluid as the uh, thumb screw is a friction lock so you don't want to interfere with that. Now you can tighten the thumb screws and fold the whole assembly back down. Now we can finally install the dust extension. The first thing I did was raise the legs to the same height as the top of the desk. That way they can support the extension and I would only have to worry about supporting the other side of the extension. Next, I flipped it over and used some clamps and uh, attached the extension to the desk temporarily. From there, I made sure the top of the extension was flush with the top of the desk. After I lined up the top of the extension with the top of the desk, I went ahead and marked out and drilled the holes for the hinges. I'm using 8 32nd by 1 inch countersink machine screws and nuts to affix this side of the hinge to the desk. I just finished up the rest of the insulation with the rest of the bolts and nuts. Optionally, you can use Loctite if you're concerned about these nuts backing out. All right, it's finished. Now let's see this bad boy in action. As you'll see, it's a nice and convenient operation to fold this whole extension down. Well, I'm really happy how this turned out. This definitely gave me a solid platform where I can continue my work and also accommodate me and my girlfriend. And of course, once this is all over, I can fold this up and not take up a lot of valuable space. It was also very inexpensive. Of course, it will differ for everyone, but this cost me roughly $32. Now that this is finished, I can get back to my incredibly urgent and important work, which is watching my and everyone's favorite show, Tiger King.